Welcome to Interview. I'm your host, Elijah McDougall, and this is my guest, Brandon Gordon, also known as Chad the Impaler. Hi. Hey, thanks for being here today. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. And for everyone out there uh, who is actually uh, listening to this, uh, Chad the Impaler uh, is a character I created in my book and has now become uh, me in real life on, on my podcast. And I guess we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of like a Batman Bruce Wayne situation. Yes. <laughs> All right. So um, you have a book and a podcast, um, or at least you're writing a book and you have a podcast. Yes. Um, could you uh, could you give me a little bit of background on how you got into this whole thing? So this is a long story for that. But um you know, the short story of this event is I started a website about, I guess it was like two or three years ago now. And it was a mental health uh, art and blog website. And I had figured out how to get to the top of rankings for uh, phobias uh, on the internet. So it was a really a phobia site and you'd come to this other part and it was doing pretty good. You know, I was getting a lot of traffic and getting some advertising money. And then one day Google uh, pressed a button and all of a sudden I was considered fake news. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> so I went from a ridiculous amount of traffic to about 3% of that traffic. Uh, and it was it was devastating to the point where I cried, and I have no problem admitting that I cried a lot. And, I would cry too. That's rough. Yeah, and eventually, you know, for a while, you know, I was throwing uh, money at it to try and fix it, and I realized this isn't a fixable problem. You know, I'm going up against Google here, and I'm just Joe Schmo, and like they don't care. So. At that point, you know, I was pretty depressed for a while. Uh, and uh, in that depression, eventually I had to like, get off, get up and do something about it. So I looked at what I'd created and one of the, the, the things about what I was building and other people were helping me create some different types of blogs and articles. Uh, one of them was my favorite one. I was writing was called uh, how to survive at the time it was actually called like the narcissist combat handbook <laughs> and uh, I created a character uh named Chad the Impaler who is me I told you mm -hmm. I get there a and he is pretty much uh an extension of myself uh, why well, I say that just like he's a 35 to 40 year old man child who lived uh you know it's an exaggerated story but he lived with uh, in, he was grown up in a coven of narcissists that was his family, his father, and his sisters. Uh, and eventually I took that idea and I combined it with, did you ever read the book, like how to survive, uh, how to like uh, the zombie survival guide by like yep, Max Brooks. Yep. So that book I thought, and someone else named Roger Ma created another book that was of similar name. And I'm like the concept that those guys had uh, of it being a training guide was uh, pretty amazing, but I felt that they didn't have a character that was endearing, that was lovable. So I created that blog being like, okay, what if I can take a subject matter that matters to people that's like socially relevant? And I d had no idea it was going to become so socially relevant, you know, with, you know, the president of the United States and all politicians really. And so I combined like an endearing character who's trying to fight his way back by creating this army. So I wrote this book. And within the time of writing that, I got to the point where it was, I'm now supposed to edit it. And some of the stories were from my life because, you know, I, in real life, I, you know, I do have a narcissistic uh, tendency uh, parent and my brother 
is probably we technically i'd say he's probably you know i don't want to diagnose borderline personality or possibly antisocial personality disorder which is other way of saying mm -hmm. sociopath so i've had a lot of experience with him you know i grew up being robbed uh blind by at the age of 10 him going to my bank pretending he was me taking out all of my money while the when i was had like paper routes he did it again when i was 12. anything i owned was always stolen wow. It didn't, it didn't matter what it was. So at a very young age, you're on edge and he had a terrible temper. So like, there's a lot of, I consider my abuser, yet I still spoke to him throughout my whole entire <laughs> life. It's very, it's very confusing yeah. uh, type of thing to deal with. And so I took a lot of those stories uh, and I kind of melded them into my story, but made it everything more absurd. Just kind of like if you watched Arrested Development, Arrested Development, the show is absurd, but within it, there's truths that are so undeniable for people that were raised mm -hmm. like me that it, it is so interesting to watch. So I kind of took that concept, put it together and wrote this book, but then I needed an audience. So I created a podcast. And at first, my podcast was this jokey podcast. Then, you know, I had on a guest who was a friend of mine who went through this kind of stuff and people responded to that episode. So another friend said, you have to go jokey or you have to go serious. And I was like, well, my book is jokey and dumb, but yet a self-help book, but like the serious part did well. So I said, go with the serious route. And then uh, some family issues arose during that time, which I've taken those episodes down that out of respect for uh, my nieces a lot of stuff came up with my brother because, you know, my brother procreated mm -hmm. and uh, has two children and his behavior has now affected ah, them. Yeah. And a whole, it was, became a whole crazy, I, I get to go into that. It, I mean, it was, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it involved, uh, I thought it was a suicide note to him wanting to be homeless to then realize that this was just all a weird manipulation. I got him put into a mental institution uh eventually when he left he agreed to all these things he reneged on those things uh his car got impounded it turned out he owed a lot of money to a lot of people and that was the reason why he sent these notes to begin with because he kind of wanted people to bail him out without without having to actually say please bail me out and then it turns out he was stealing from people um including his children so it all kind of unfolded while I started doing this podcast and then I started having on more people like me, uh, people that then dated uh, narcissists or sociopaths or people with these dis cluster B personality disorders. And slowly but surely, people from all over the world started to like get a hold of me and want to share their story. And, you know, since then, it's been growing and growing and growing. And every day, my role as not just someone who listens to people on the show is, is one aspect of everything, but I get emails from people uh, or texts from people with whatever issues they're having. So now I'm making phone calls for people to try and get them free help, to get them to the right people. I, I mean, I'm not a social worker, but I've taken on the role as one uh, in the background. You know, I get like probably like three to four people get a hold of me now per week where like I'm just trying to get them the right uh, proper help that they can get. And that in itself has become a job in its own right. It just kind of went that way. So all of a sudden I went from, I want an audience to sell my book to, to I'm on the front lines uh, helping people get to where, you know, sharing your stories, making people feel less alone sharing my own life when I can, you know, from people that were raised by narcissistic behavior, like people, I call them now high conflict people to people who dated them, who I have, I have experience in that as well, because when you grow up like I did, you know, what you're used to in life is the exact same thing. So, you know, mm -hmm. someone who's normal was always boring to me, you know, but at the same time, I had my self-worth based and routed in pleasing people. So that's what I knew. And so it was, 
inevitable for me to start dating people like that and to be taken advantage of. And the last one that I dated, uh, you know, the boring ones, I, you know, I stopped dating them pretty quick, even though I, I call them boring. They're just good people. But the last one was, in my mind, a, a sociopath. And mm. the, the di- like growing up with them is one thing, the people who are dating them and the uh, abuse that goes on there. You know, uh, I being a man, uh, it's hard to understand, especially in domestic violence situations with women, why women keep on mm-hmm. going back and things like that. But being on this side of the coin, uh, when it comes to like narcissistic abuse and cluster B personality disorders, I understand you know, I know why they stay. I, I understand that aspect of everything now. And so I have a pretty good grasp of all of the aspects. I don't have the clue about how it works with uh, if you have children with them and because you have to keep in contact with them after, which is very difficult. But in the process, I wanted to learn um, because this became has become my life. So I've had on uh, therapists and recently a lawyer onto the show uh, is that they're experts in domestic violence and like divorce cases. So I got to listen to them and ask them questions. And I took user questions, that user, I, 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 I uh, follower questions, listener questions as well. And I, I get to learn now everything about it. So I'm not an expert in it. I'm just well-versed in being abused by them. <laughs> and That's so sad. and I, I, well, this is the thing. I'm a natural coper that likes to laugh and that's how you always kind of got by. And so I do my best to keep very dark subjects as light as possible. And I try to do my best to have a laugh with everyone on the show. Not always possible. Sometimes, you know, the only thing you can do is laugh at like, look at these terrible decisions I made again. You know, that, that kind of became my life and it is kind of where it is now. And if you told me, Six months ago or seven months ago, this is what my life would be like. I would call you crazy. If you told me six years ago, this would be my life seven years ago, I'd call you insane. You know, <laughs> it would just it wasn't even on my radar that this was uh, a thing. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, it's really funny, too, because like you've built your army like the army from your book is now an army. Yes, in real life, it is. Art, 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 art has art created life and life. Sorry, art has imitated life and life imitates art. It happened. Yep. That's this is a textbook example yeah. of that. And it's just so fascinating that I just want to say I like given what I know about mental health situations and, and uh, kind of growing up with this kind of stuff like you're kind of a shining success when it comes to like what you could have been doing with your life and like you're turning that childhood trauma and hurt into a tool to help people and i think that's something that's really just don't forget how big of a deal that is you're giving people an out that you yourself didn't really have and i think that's really important because having known some people in my life who've grown up with narcissists or have um struggled with people with those those cluster b personality disorders like they need this kind of stuff and so for those people that i do know thank you for for dedicating your life to doing this i think um to given the kind of inner seating that you're doing for people when it comes to helping them find you know therapy and solutions and whatever help they need like all the little guys all the people who have been dealing with this kind of stuff and need that on the day-to-day so you're doing really good work and i love that it's tied into this like more entertaining book aspect but then the application of it is very much a serious not tongue in cheek. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I do want to sell my book, but it oh, but it became it, I I mean it got put on the back burner, like my editing. I would have wanted to finish my editing, but you know, this other stuff became more important. And when you're talking about first of all, thank you for being nice and giving saying kind words about what I'm doing. And when stuff happened it started happening with my brother uh within all of this, you know, my first thing was how do I protect my nieces uh and uh you know I felt when these things were happening and the way my parents were reacting to it uh, and how they were talking to my nieces trying to still protect my brother it really threw me back into a hole of being feeling helpless when you're a younger child 
it really, this, you know, I'm bringing this now all kind of all the way back of when all this really started and, you know, how I say it started when it did, but there was an incident that happened before that where I was dating someone who's still my friend. And that person always was trying to tell me, like, show me that, you know, I wasn't, not that I wasn't acting right, but she could tell that I had a lot of problems that I wasn't addressing that all stemmed from my family. She was doing her best to point it out to me, and I never could see it. And then eventually, when things stopped being romantic, I was like, I was pretty upset. She was trying to tell me all these things. And that's when I realized that she was just a pattern in my life. So I went and I did this thing called uh, the Hoffman process. And the Hoffman process is all about pattern breaking. And I went and stayed overnight at this place for eight days. I got to meet people who were treating their children mostly in a way that they said they would never treat their children, but they couldn't stop themselves. They were acting just like their parents. So while I was there, you really got to break down um, your family and how you were raised. And you got to understand why your parents were the way they were, uh, everything like that. It was like two years of therapy done in eight days. And it was just like a giant, you know, you were having cardiac arrest. They took, what are those things called? Those paddles? Yeah. And it's like, boom. And it, they did their best to resuscitate you. And I took it as like, they just were trying to make you uh, aware, as aware as possible to how you're acting. Like this happens and this is how you act. This is how you react. Uh, so I got this like crash course in me in, in, in that eight day period. And in that eight day period, I finally understood, you know, why I was the way I was, why my brother is the way he is, why my sister is the way she is. And why my parents are the way they are and how we all interact in our dysfunctional family. Uh, so when I, I, I came back, everyone in my family was shocked that I went to do this. They didn't understand They because I, I was the rock of the family. I was the one who was the sensible one. I was, you know, this guy is not the one that has the problems or anything like that. So they were kind of shocked. So when I came back, the next day, I went grocery shopping with my sister, who is six years older. And my sister has a different mother than me, but we lived together our whole entire life. Biologically, she was a different mom, but raised the same. We're saying we're raised with the same mom. And uh, her mom on the other side, her biological mom is not a great lady. She was walking with me, and we were in the grocery store. My sister, first thing she says to me, she goes, do you hate me? And I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? And she's like, because I started thinking about you when uh, you went to do this thing. And I couldn't remember any memories of you growing up. She had pressed or blocked everything. And I found that wow. like so interesting. And uh, because she was dealing with another mother and like whatever she had to deal with with that. I mean, I, I, underst I finally understood what she had to deal with. So I said, no, I don't hate you. In fact, like my only, my, my very few memories of you are only good memories of you trying to protect me. Um, because I don't have that memories, m many memories of her, of her as well. Her and my brother always deemed me as like being the golden, not the golden child of the family, but my mom loving me the most. And I'm the youngest. And I tried to explain to her, I'm like, by the way, like my mom doesn't, her mom doesn't love me more. It's just that when we were younger, I was being abused by my brother. My mom wasn't doing anything about it because she was trying to save my brother from the temper of my father. So all of these things would be, would slide. So like, I'm trying to voice my life and no one's listening to me. So I emotionally detached from everybody because no one was helping me or doing anything about my brother. I say my mom only uh, is the way she is towards me is because she's trying to get me back. Like, you guys are always needing her. I detached because I didn't want to need anyone anymore because that was what was best for me as a kid. 
because if I trusted you, I only got burned and it was painful. I didn't know I was doing that. It was subconscious that that's what was going on, but that was reality. So I said to her, like you deeming my mom uh, to love me more has nothing to do with that. It's her not feeling loved and wanting me to love her. And I go, that is what you don't understand. She feels you guys needing her so much that she doesn't have to do more. And subconsciously, my mom has no idea what's going on. Her emotional IQ is not high enough to understand these things. She went to therapy once and was too scared if she went too far with it, what might occur. So she stopped going. She's just stuck in this thing. And that's where she'll be. And I have no issues with that. But for me, you know, that's kind of how I grew up, where it was with these, within a dysfunctional home and having to protect yourself. And those protections were my protections my whole life. But eventually I moved out and I tried to have relationships with people. And it was impossible because I was still being this old version of me. And, but that wasn't the reality. These people that I'm trying to deal with aren't trying to burn me, aren't, you know, my friends are like, I'm dealing with a good person here. But all of the way I acted was now hindering me going forward in my life. And then eventually all that stuff kind of steamrolled. I started getting interested in how I worked, how other people work. And I found other people fascinating to the point where there was like a bar restaurant across the street from where I lived. And I just wanted to talk to people. So I asked the people on, on Saturday night, there's a little booth in the corner. Can I have an, a bad advice booth? So they said, sure. So I, I, you know, my friend made me banana bread. I sat in the corner and I waited for drunk people to tell me the stories of their life. And I just sat there and I, and I listened to them. And, uh, you know, at that point I didn't give very good advice. So it was good giving me like that. It was called bad advice. But one day this one person uh, was listening to me talk to her friend and she didn't like what I was saying to uh, one of her friends and she kicked me and I was like <laughs> what are you doing and she kicked it she's like you should not be doing this I'm like this isn't a serious thing it's a bad advice boosh. and she goes you need to be certified to do this for a living I'm a psychology student blah 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 I stopped doing it after that day it really upset me I was trying to like do this fun thing and connect with people and, and that person I mean, physically kicked me. Uh, I didn't like think I could go back to school. You know, my grades weren't the greatest to go take like a master's degree in like social work or anything like that. So I went and I took a coaching program. I went to San I was like, I'm going to go to San Francisco and hope it's like this magical journey that I go back and forth to like four times within like a year and a half period. And uh, I went and I did that and I got like my designation, like my coaching, I guess, certification. And then with that, I then created my website after that. I got good at when I did that program, I got pretty good at listening to people and not interrupting and being there for people and creating like a safe space. And then all these little things kind of added up. So it was like, you know, I say this, it was like happened in this very short amount of time, but I guess I took these baby steps along the way that got me here, not really knowing where I was going. I had no roadmap. I just kind of went with it. Was that, was that scary for you? I mean, given everything that you had endured so far, you, I mean, being the rock of your family and then kind of striking out on your own, was it scary to no longer have that kind of, pressure on you like directly and then getting to this point now i mean you kind of have to end up being your own rock like how did that work for you i still am that that person for my family you know because these things are still going on what re recently you know i had to disengage uh especially you know right now i am no contact pretty much with my brother or it's very 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 low contact with my brother uh, you know, my sister and I were parents to my parents have had to deal with this for so long because they did not know how, you know, my, gr I think maybe my greatest moment, my great, this is my, gr my, this is my greatest moment years ago. So my brother has been in rehab twice in his life, should have gone more. And he was a kid he was a gambling addict for a while. And I've been an addict, by the way. Uh, that's a whole other story. 
but he was been he's an addict and he, he was a gambler and after the episode two we went my sister me my mom my dad and my brother's wife or common-law wife at the time and we went and sat with a psychologist and we went and sat with a social worker and we had this meeting kind of like a pre-intervention and we're sitting there and if you're not really know this world like parents and other people really try and still sugarcoat things like like oh he's not that bad or like these things they're just still trying to protect the person because he's they're still their son you know with my brother's girlfriend she's still also in this syndrome of like a stockholm syndrome of like like feeling guilty if she says bad things about him so we're in this whole entire thing they're all telling these stories when the psychologist and the social worker are asking questions and about 30 minutes in the psychologist stops and goes hold on everyone and he looks at me and he goes you haven't said a thing i go all of these people are trying to make it seem nicer than it is and they're kind of lying you're not talking you know the truth you speak that moment of my life i'm getting emotional while just thinking about it still that that man could just look at me and see me and what i have been dealing with my whole life was just a, a words i can't put it into words i have goosebumps and tears in my eyes right now just whew, i'm about to cry just just talking about it because it was such an important thing for someone who is in my shoes and other people's shoes to be heard and seen for the first time and have a witness of what has gone on. You know, at that point, the, I, he, he, I go, ask me a question. I'll, I'll answer whatever your question is. And he's like, just give me a story. So I told this one story. I forget what it was. And my mom goes, how come you never told us that before? And I go, okay, here's another one. And my mom goes, stop, I don't want to know. And I look at her and I go, that's why we're here. That was a huge deal to me. And the fact that like now that I get to do that for people and be that person that that guy was for me, is a really big deal to me. He changed my life in a huge way. And it was something just very, very simple. And I don't even know, I forgot what your question was originally and how I got off. No, 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 it's totally okay. But I think what that guy was to you was like the, the pattern breaker of, if you think about it, like your whole family's repeating everything back to you that you've ever said to like justify why you're fine with what was happening. And having someone of outside authority validate that you had something to say and you didn't have to keep repeating the everything's exactly. fine mantra, like being the pattern breaker for your life enables you to be here now. And you're just you're passing that on for people. And I think that's really profound. I, I don't even know what to really say to that, but that's just a really profound experience for you to share. So, yeah, that you reminded me that got me back to. So today you know, being a rock for people, my sister and I uh, have kind of disengaged because uh, in a way, my parents are still trying to fix the old problem or the situation the exact same way. And it's just too frustrating. We kind of are there for my niece, our niece, my nieces, uh, and do our, you know, our best that way to help her. But as far as like being parents to my parents, we've disengaged uh on that front but in other manners of like things of like helping out within my family or or certain things that aren't to do with that aspect of everything i'm still involved but on that one aspect i am not uh they try to get me involved uh still they mention things when you're like i don't want to even hear about this kind of stuff they'll still do it which is frustrating that's tough i mean even with my mom uh, like about three weeks ago, she asked me, like, have you spoken to your brother? And I said, no. And she's like, when are you going to do that? And I'm like, whenever I'm good and ready. And she's like, well, when is that going to be? And I said, I don't know. I don't know if that ever will happen. But whenever right now, my life is pretty good. And like, I'm OK right now. And like, I am OK, me. And she's like, why are you doing this to me? 
And I said, excuse me? She says, why can't you speak to your brother? Why are you doing this to me? And I go, I've done nothing to you. I go, why are you making this about me doing something to you? Like, this has nothing to do with you. This has nothing to do with me and, like, or you. Like, my brother has his own path he needs to take. And that's the end of this conversation. And she's like, and she went left in a huff. So they're still in this and they can't let it go. Uh, and it's frustrating that they want to drag you back into it. But I, I'm at a point where I'm not getting dragged back into it. My sister and I are on the same page. We're kind of a united front and we've never gotten along better <laughs> than right now. So that that's the one thing. I've never gotten along better in my life with my sister. Kind of like your enemy of your enemy is your friend. You know, I and in a way I feel like when, you know, I love Bart Simpson. And then you kind of like you like Lisa Simpson. But when Bart and Lisa Simpson team up together to like fight sh- Sideshow Bob, those are great episodes. And right now I feel uh, those I feel like are like oh, yeah. me and my sister right now are like Bart and Lisa Simpson. <laughs> oh man i love that because it's funny how like as you become an adult like those perspectives get shifted and like i mean you you said like your sister doesn't really have memories of you but she still has like an innate affection for you as a sibling and i think that even if you know her mind has been you know kind of shut down that way like that bonding and that teamwork still doesn't like go away. So I'm glad that you guys are getting a chance to do this now. And I, I remember in, I think it was the previous episode to the one you just put out, but you had mentioned that your sister um, kind of prompted you to get back on another call with the person you were interviewing because um, she felt like there was more there. And I really think that having that partner to kind of call things out that maybe you can't see as the direct, it's kind of like the, the direct contact for some of these people. Like that's really helpful. Oh yeah, it was, it was. It's really helpful now. Like my sister and I really have never had anything that much in common, and now that my sister is a social worker by trade originally, and then became a mediator, uh, now we have all of these things we can have these other types of conversations about that we never could before. Because usually it was just about like our family and like our complaining, uh, you know. And eventually, when all you do is complain to each other eventually that kind of runs its course so now having all these other things it's nice to it's nice to have yeah to like ha- have that kind of bonding and something else then you know we can go out and do something and not talk about our family which has never been a thing that's a really like that's a really calming thought and i think like knowing that like those those kinds of things can heal and like you can kind of move on from i mean you're not like moving on from your family stuff but like that it's not the point of conversation anymore means that you two have healed considerably from the the situation yeah in in, at least in the the way that i see it um i'm not an expert but um i'm glad that you guys get to do that it's it's been nice i mean i've been around i'm 43 years old my sister is 49 so we're finally getting to really know each other after uh this long a time it took us long enough (laughs) yeah so are you uh, you good with uh, switching gears for a minute yeah, sure. All right. Um, so I, I'm really fascinated by the thought of your book. So I don't know how much you're able to or you want to talk about your book, just given that it's still in the editing phase. Um, maybe what's the, like the crux, like the funniest part of your book that you like you want to be a really solid connecting point with your audience when it eventually does come out? So uh, first thing I for- even forgot to mention, my book is called How to Survive the Narcissist Apocalypse. It's not out yet, but my podcast is also called the same thing. I guess the thing about my book, you know, I took the framework of uh, the Zombie Survival Guide by Max Brooks and another one that was by Roger Ma. And the funny thing is about that is that my comedy hero is Mel Brooks, who is Max Brooks's dad. And which is really strange that I didn't realize that initially. So that that was pretty interesting. So, you know, Mel Brooks is a hero of mine. Uh, and I guess Norman Lear was someone he was his contemporary and, and Carl Reiner, uh, who is Rob Reiner's dad. 
Mel Brooks to me was a renegade at a time. He was talking about things in his movies, just like Monty Python was subjects he covered that were like taboo. And he did them in ways that were funny, Uh, you know, taking the subject of narcissism and how to make that funny, but also translating a story, which is effective to people that get people thinking about a real subject. So I guess the kind of taking the whole training manual and stealing the the framework of everything from Max Brooks, but then adding elements of my own personality in there. So I guess one of the funniest things you can find in my book is there are three things going on. One is the training manual aspect of it. Uh, the second thing going on is while that is happening, you're you're being told the story of my character's life. Everything about him, his likes, his dislikes, how he grew up, his family, the people, uh, his friends in his life, and everything has a story to it. So if he's explaining something about a narcissistic trait, he'll break into a story of the actual uh, life event that occurred that best suits it. And sometimes he gets really worked up because just like me, you're doing well. And you're getting better and things affect you. But sometimes something triggers you and you fall five steps backwards and you're in a state of disarray and you're angry and you're pissed off. And uh, so what I did in my book was when those things happen, I made his him have a trusty sidekick. And that's his uh, psychiatrist or therapist. And his name is Dr. Jonas Vaughn. So Dr. Jonas Vaughn is reading the book as he is writing it. So whenever it seems like he's getting triggered about something, all of a sudden, an impromptu psychiatry session begins. And they start having like this real conversation about like, what happened? Like, I know something's going on. Obviously, I switch them up every single time. But then you start getting this relationship between these two guys that's happening um, and how eventually you realize that the psychiatrist is the first person he could ever trust in his life. They have their own interesting relationship while this book is going on. So there's this relationship within the book, within the book. Other aspects of it is there's also this underlying story of the social political aspect of social media and creating new narcissists, which is a thing that why he's creating this training manual in in this, this army is because he wants to stop uh, the new onslaught of narcissists that are coming our way. And he blames social media, specifically Mark Zuckerberg. And there's this whole, there's this whole other weird story of him creating a plan and reconnaissance missions. And there's maps and things like that uh, for him to go eventually assassinate Mark Zuckerberg because in his belief, because he's a huge movie fan, if you kill the head vampire, like in vampire movies, all of the other vampires that he cre- that he turned will come back and be normal people again. So there's this whole vampire lore that, that has been created. And also, I'm a big movie fan. So I've been able in, in many spots, and there's reasons why they happen, where all of a sudden you start reading these movie outlines that my character had created and they're all ludicrous, but they all have their actual plates. It's not like they're out of nowhere in a way they're out of nowhere, but they all fit a conversation that has kind of gone on where they get to be introduced and in in themselves, they are these ludicrous things. And within those, I also tackle other subjects that are social political subjects. I tackle the Tibet Chinese war, like not war, but differences between Ch- Tibet and China in one of them. I discuss in one of these, st- in one of these dumb story, like movie outlines, incel culture, uh, which is a ludicrous story in itself. <laughs> one of them is a fan fiction movie outline for a nightmare on Elm street. Just a lot of it, like stories within stories within stories. And my first friend who read it, and the first friend I gave it to is actually the girl who told me to go to take the Hoffman process. I'm like, you're the first person that's allowed to read this because you understand, this is me. So I gave it to her to read, and she, 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 she came back to me and says, you created a world. And it's not just a book. It's like, it's a world. It's this 
character's world and how they live and how they think and it's self-help and it's dumb but it's funny and you'll learn stuff about you without tooting my own narcissistic horn in like if you read all these narcissism books they're all done in the same way and they're trying to help you through a situation or disarming a narcissist and they're they're all helpful books toxic parents no one has made a book like mine in this field or on this subject matter in a funny way entertaining and i guess part of why i wanted to do it is not for the just the people who are looking for answers uh, of what they went through and and want to know how to heal you know i don't consider myself to be a healing book in that sense i to me it's more of like a you're not alone type book but you'll laugh And at the same time, I I wanted my book to be able to cross over to regular culture and like into a more of a pop culture thing, because part of my book has pop culture elements. But also a lot of people in their life know that there's something wrong and they haven't been able to put a finger on it and they haven't done any research or reading about it and they're not there yet. So in a weird way, if my book crosses over, it will reach people who might be able to be like, wow. This sounds a lot like me, and my life might not be going that great. Maybe I'll start to look further into what this is and maybe try and make a better go of what's going on or improve myself. And so I kind of want it to be like a a jumping off point for some people that if I'm able to cross over with it, that they never thought they would figure out this missing part of their life. And it's not more on the people who are ready to go on to the next stage, but more of like a jumping off point done in the weirdest way you can think of. Thank you for listening to this episode of Interview. If you would like to support this podcast, please subscribe for more episodes and leave us a rating in iTunes. If you would like to further support us, please consider donating at the links in the episode description. Interview is a Victory or Death Media production. 